We begin where we left off last time, about halfway through the first section, the burial of the dead. We ended with the rather haunting beckoning of the speaker that he will show the reader something different from either our shadow at morning striding behind us, the image of our past and our memories that are shrouded in shadow, or your shadow at evening rising to meet you, the image of the future, the desire for something better to come that is not necessarily hopeful or even possible. And he says, I will show you fear in a handful of dust, this present that we live in that is barren, empty, uh, reducing us simply to the dust with which we were made. And now we have another one of Eliot's intrusions, this interrupting voice from another language. This is in German. It's an excerpt from an opera by Wagner entitled Tristan and his soul. And it's an opera that the context of the opera will help us understand its inclusion here at this point in the burial of the dead. The Tristan and Isolde uh, essentially recounts a love story that uh, at this point in the opera in which this is quoted, Tristan is in England and Isolde is across the Irish Sea in Ireland. And Tristan is lamenting the absence of his lover and wishing to see her return home. Uh, he's looking out across the Irish Sea toward where his lover is and hoping that she'll come home. And this excerpt here uh, roughly translates to say, Fresh blows the wind to the homeland. My Irish sweetheart, where are you? And it's this question of where his lover is. Where is the other half uh, that completes me? She is, she's gone. She's lost. Um, and it's this kind of mourning, this lament, this desire for something that may or may not return to us that epitomizes what we've seen in the burial of the dead so far, the, the blending of a memory that we can never recapture and a desire that we might not ever be able to lay claim to. Uh, that middle ground where we see the handful of dust in our present, this fear between a memory we can't revisit and a desire we may not be able to have. Uh, Tristan is caught in that moment. He is remembering the memory of his time with his old and desirous of the time to be uh, renewed for an encounter to be made, and yet he ends with the question, where are you, my Irish sweetheart, where are you? And then we move on to a new voice, uh, and this again this seems to be a blending of a, a memory that was pleasant and lovely uh, with the desire to have it again that is unmet and unresolved. We have the image of the hyacinth girl, and she seems to be speaking. We have the the gentleman re responding to her up at this dash here, but she seems to say, you gave me hyacinths, which is a lovely flower with a purple hue. You gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They called me the hyacinth girl. We need to stop there. This image seems to be a, a loving one between um, a lover and, and his beloved, that he gave her hyacinths and adorned her in beautiful flowers, enough so that she was called the hyacinth girl, that that was her identity almost. That she was this loved, beautiful, uh, s stable figure in this relationship. That she was loved and cared for and adorned with praises and beauty. Yet, we see the response. Yet, when we came back late from the Hyacinth Garden. And notice they are leaving the garden together. There's something Edenic in that sense. That what was once a loving paradise of a relationship between the two. He says, yet when we came back late from the garden, your arms full, your hair wet, I could not speak, and my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead, and I knew nothing. And we see that he has been diminished and reduced into essentially nothing, that at that time, she was the hyacinth girl. She wore the flowers. They had a, a relationship. Yet, when we came back from the garden, your arms full of hyacinths, your hair wet from the ponds, I could not speak. He could not declare any kind of love. My eyes failed. I could not see to see, to quote Emily Dickinson. I, I could not see you for what you once were. I was nothing. I was neither living nor dead. 
And this is the image of the undead, the, the gray area between life and death that Elliot seems to believe we exist in, that later on in The Burial of the Dead, he'll depict a crowd of the undead, a crowd of walking undead uh, crossing the London Bridge, that they are neither living nor dead. They are just uh, hollow men, as he'll say in a, in a separate poem. Neither living nor dead, essentially nothing. Forced with this burden of consciousness, forced to live, we cannot do anything else. But we have a life with no meaning. We are dead, we see nothing, we speak nothing, we know nothing. He said, I was looking into the heart of light, the silence. Here, the heart of light beckoning back to the beauty and light that she bears in her being. He was looking at her and looking into the heart of light and the silence, but to ultimately no end. And we have again a quote from Wagner here to end this section. Desolate and empty the sea. And it's important that we characterize the sea as desolate and empty. That this is the very same sea that Tristan is looking, peering across, looking for Isolde, looking for his lost love. Here, though, the sea he is looking across for, that ship that bears his love, is desolate and empty. That what if there is no ship bearing his beloved, bringing her back home at the edge of the horizon? What if the sea that distances lovers is desolate and empty? What if the distance between our present and our past and our future is infinite as the horizon? And as Eliot promised, we have another voice, these competing voices toppling on top of each other, much like the Tower of Babel. We have a separate voice now, a separate encounter. We jump cut to it with no real transition. Madame Sesostris, famous clairvoyant. Madame Sesostris being a fortune teller. A secular version of the seer that we had at the beginning of the epigraph with the Sibyl. The prophetess who wished for eternal life, but neglected to wish for eternal youth. And so we have an eternity of life, but also an eternity of age. We have the image of the seer and the prophetess who cannot see so well as to wish for the right thing, and thus is caught in a perpetual uh, aging, a perpetual uh, punishment, a curse of eternity with no youth. Madame Sesostris, famous clairvoyant, had a bad cold. So again, we have this image of the seer or the fortune teller that is flawed or broken, perhaps not so supernatural as we once thought. The supernatural figure that we can trust, the prophet, that the son of man who once could foretell the future, that operated as the very mouthpiece of God, yet the son of man that cannot say or guess, but knows only a heap of broken images, now we have the fortune teller, that has a bad cold, the fortune teller that uh, cannot foresee anything of real substance, cannot even take care of herself. She had a bad cold, nevertheless, she is known to be the wisest woman in Europe. Doesn't say much for the state of affairs in Europe at the time. This modern world we live in is flawed and broken. The most trusted voice, the wisest woman in Europe, is a famous clairvoyant that has a bad cold, that she is not so um, all-knowing, not so supernatural. With a wicked pack of cards, this is known as the tarot, the cards that a fortune teller uses to flip over, to, for, um, to foresee somebody's future, to declare someone's fate to be a certain way. So she brings out her wicked pack of cards to tell the tale, the, the fortunes of all of us. Here, here, said she, is your card. Notice that second person, that we are being told our fortune here, that she is speaking directly to the reader. It's a device Eliot will use again at the last line of the Burial of the Dead. Here, said she, is your card, that she is predicting our future for us. The drowned Phoenician sailor. This is Death by Water which, interestingly, is the title of section 4 of the Wasteland that Eliot uses. That that's what we are to fear, death by water. The drowned Phoenician sailor, that is your card. 
those are pearls that were his eyes. This is a quick allusion to a, a play by Shakespeare called The Tempest, uh, in which a sailor is presumed to have drowned. It turns out he didn't, but it's presumed that he drowns. And legend has it that when a sailor drowns and is lost to the bottom of the ocean, he is transformed into something mystical and something beautiful. And so this line that those are pearls that were his eyes is an indication that he has begun to transform away from uh, a deceased human drowned to the bottom of the sea, turning into something a bit more angelic or supernatural. His eyes are turning to pearls. And it's this hint at resurrection that we saw earlier ironically doesn't actually take place. That There is no real prospect of rebirth in Eliot's wasteland. So we view this indication of eyes becoming pearls with a sense of irony, that that is not our fate as drowned sailors. What once sufficed and what once brought us comfort no longer can. So that's our first card. The second card, here is Belladonna, the beautiful lady, the lady of the rocks. And this is a religious formulation, usually applied to Mary, that she is Our Lady of Mercy or Our Lady of Grace. Um, yet here we see the twist, that it is the Lady of the Rocks, which is Eliot's image of the wasteland. Remember earlier, what are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? That is the, f the fundamental uh, image of the wasteland, that there is nothing fertile about it. Nothing can grow in this modern world we live in. April is the cruelest month for bringing the prospect of growth in April showers to land that is dull, dull roots, mixed with memory and desire, ultimately producing nothing. So Belladonna is the lady of the rocks, the lady of the wasteland, which is to say uh, no real salvation figure at all, the lady of situations. Next card, here is the man with three staves, and here the wheel. Now this is an image we need to speak to because um, Eliot and many modernists uh, and other literary figures even in history perceived the wheel to be the fundamental design of nature. And there are a few different ways they noticed that truth. Reaching all the way on a, a macro and a micro level. In the first instance, we have the wheel of time. Seasons change. We go from spring to summer to fall to winter and then back to spring. It seems an endless cycle. The cycle of day to night. We wake in the morning. We go to work. Pass into the afternoon. We approach evening. We go to sleep and then we live it all over again. That time itself seems fundamentally cyclical, which for Eliot, in his pessimistic view of the wasteland, seems to view it as a monotony, a routine that we're caught in, that doesn't present any real way of escape. But also, you'll notice the planets orbit around the sun. That is a cyclical uh, design that they cycle around, uh, giving us something to model our lives around that we map our months and our years around the cycles of the planets, but even down to our blood, the circulation of the blood in our bodies is a cyclical motion. The revolutions of protons and neutrons around the atom are most basic building block. All of it from top to bottom seems to be an endless wheel. And so when we see the wheel as part of our fate, it seems to coincide with the way nature fundamentally is, but it also presents a foreboding view of what our fate will look like. It will look a, a lot like what it looks like now. That what if our lives and our fates, our futures, look more like a gerbil on a treadmill uh, than a, an, in a steep and steady incline? We go further up and further in, to quote C.S. Lewis. What if that's not the case? What if we simply revolve? in our days and our months and our years just cycle around and we are just simply caught in the machinery of the modern world. How can there be a prospect of hope or growth if that is the summation of our existence, the wheel endlessly revolving? And here is the one-eyed merchant, a card that would later become the jack. And this card, she says, which is blank, is something he carries on his back. So the jack carries the blank card on his back as a burden.
And this hints at the burden of consciousness that human beings are required to bear that we have no choice in the matter of our consciousness or our existence. We are subjected to this world by birth, and we have no real choice. And so for the, that next card that she presents to be blank seems to present uh, a meaninglessness to it all. A sense of oblivion. That there is no real solution or no real resolution to all of these conflicts and fears that we face. Um, the card is ultimately blank, yet we must carry it on our back. And Madame Sesostris is forbidden to see it. Even the wisest woman in Europe is not able to tell the meaning or the substance of this blank card we bear, this burden of consciousness. The great question as to why we are here. Why are we caught in this wheel? Why are we existing in this wasteland? Madame Sesostris cannot tell us and neither can any other form of truth that once satisfied. We are forbidden to see. She says, I do not find the hanged man, which that card in the Tarot pack uh, embodies the sense of a messiah, a scapegoat figure, one who would take on the punishments or the sins of another. She says, I do not find this Christ figure, this messiah figure. And she reiterates what she started with, fear death by water. Again, giving us a taste of what we'll see at section four of the wasteland, where we are actually presented with an episode of Death by Water with the drowned Phoenician sailor. But perhaps most interesting is this last piece that she gives the reader. She says, I do see, earlier she said, I do not see the hanged man. I see crowds of people walking round in a ring. And this is interesting because it's a straight allusion to Dante's Inferno, in which Dante comes to the lip of the pit of hell and peers downward, and all he is able to see are the many layers of hell spiraling downward into the center of the earth, the, these layers, these walkways carved into the edge of the earth that simply spiral down, creating different layers or different casts of hell. And he's remarking here that what he sees are crowds of people walking around in a ring. Which brings that hell image straight to the forefront of our fortune. That if this is the last image that Madame Sesostris sees, we have nothing but to deepen ourselves into a great pit of despair, to see our existence simply walking around in a ring, enduring this wheel image, cycling through our hours and our weeks and our months, ultimately to no end. We live, we go to work, we drink our coffee, we go to bed, we get married, we grow old, and ultimately we die. But if that's the end, if death is our final event, what hope do we have? And that is the real question that Elliot brings to the forefront. If this wasteland is the culmination of our life, why should we look to things to satisfy us or to present any real kind of uh, hope or purpose to our existence? Are we not simply walking around in a ring? Are we not crowds of people spiraling ever downward, much like the Sybil who is aging and aging and aging as she lives forever, that there is no real end? There's no real purpose to it. There's no meaning behind it. Thank you, she says. If you see dear Mrs. Equitone, tell her I bring the horoscope myself. One must be so careful these days. These days, hinting at the modern world we live in. We must be skeptical. Distrust everything. Surely we must, right? If everything we once knew from literature, from religion, from philosophy, from music and art, if all of it in this modern world has, has been diminished and reduced to this wasteland we live in where we are simply idly, idly circling around to no meaning and to no end, how can we have any real authority on anything? Who can be trusted? What can be trusted? 
these days are fraught with betrayal, skepticism, cynicism, meaninglessness. In this last section, Eliot presents probably one of his most famous images in the wasteland, but he begins it with a reference to Baudelaire's poetry. Charles Baudelaire is a French poet, a 19th century French poet, famous for his collection of poetry called The Flowers of Evil. But in that collection, he describes Paris, the, the city he loved so much, as an unreal city. The city that is not quite real, that is surreal and um, ghostly even. And now Eliot is applying that phrase to describe London, as we'll see. London is the unreal city, this ghostly, ethereal, undead city. This modern world being filled with ghosts of, what, of who we once were. Unreal city under the brown fog of a winter dawn. Notice we are underneath a fog. We are trapped within this framework. That we are under the fog that isolates us, blinds us, confuses us. There is a great shroud over the wasteland that prohibits us from seeing. Remember the man responding to the hyacinth girl, I could not speak, I could not see, my eyes failed. And now we are shrouded in fog, unable to see ahead of us. Everything is wrapped in shadow. A crowd, notice the repetition here, the same crowd that Dante saw in hell that Madame Sesostris foretold, now Eliot sees a crowd flowing over London Bridge. And he'll repeat this word, flowing, later. It seems like crowds of people are pouring over London Bridge, much like the Thames that flows beneath it. A crowd, he says, flowed over London Bridge. So many. I had not thought death had undone so many. Here's another quote from Dante. Again, as he is uh, winding his way through the inferno, at the beginning of Dante's great Divine Comedy. One of his great astonishing remarks is, is that he is simply amazed at how many people populate this hell. And yet here, Eliot uses the same phrase to describe the kind of astonishment we see at how many people have been undone by this living death that the modern world provides. They are not physically dead. They are shuffling across London Bridge, cycling through their hours and their days pointlessly, purposelessly. So it presents a living death, a monotony that is perhaps more frightening than death. At least death is finite. Death is uh, definite. But this living death we live in in, in the modern age, this, this existence that uh, is unexplainable, without purpose, without meaning, is worse. And so for Eliot, London is now a sort of hell with crowds of people flowing over it, going to their jobs, working from nine to five, coming home, eating dinner, going to bed, waking up to do it all over again. He says this death has undone so many. We have become unraveled by the wasteland we live in. Sighs, short and infrequent, were exhaled, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet. Wilfred Owen has a quotes similar in his great poem, Dolce et Decorum Est, a World War I poem. He says, men marched asleep. And that image for Owen, applied to World War I and the trench warfare that he saw firsthand, uh, is this despairing, depressing reality that men are, are simply following the leader. We lock arms with those ahead of us and we march asleep. We trudge through the dirt and soil of this um, barren land that has been destroyed by bombs and explosions and death and decay. It's just nothing can be the same as it once was. There's no growth. We march asleep. We march as hollow men, pointlessly flowing over London Bridge. But each man fixed his eyes before his feet. This has another um, interesting quality to it, that human fellowship and communion and camaraderie has almost entirely vanished. 
And it's the irony here that they are not alone, yet they are lonely, that we need to pick up here. They are not alone. This is a crowd of people jam-packed on London Bridge, uh, yet all of them have their eyes fixed on their own feet. That they are fundamentally lonely and isolated from one another and detached from one another. There is no meaningful intimacy in the wasteland anymore. Everything has been neutered of its joy and its purpose that it once had. Yet we are still crowded together. We are still stuck together on this earth. And perhaps we can't help but see a 21st century parallel here uh, that one might notice the kind of online presence that we have where we would point to hundreds of friends on Facebook and Instagram, these, these communities that we feel so uh, invested in and so much a part of, that we belong to this vast network of friends and communities and families, and yet an outside observer might notice that it's simply one person uh, stuck at a desk looking at a computer screen, that we feel like we are uh, companions, that we are friends, that we are all connected on this great playing together. But the deeper reality that underlies all of that is that we are detached. We are fundamentally disconnected from one another. Can't help but wonder what Elliot would have thought of this internet age that we live in now, a hundred years later. This crowd flows up the hill and down the street. Again, the kind of monotony we see, they go up and they come down. That is what their existence has come to. They go down King William Street to where St. Mary Woolnoth kept the hours with a dead sound on the final stroke of nine. St. Mary Woolnoth being a church in London at the end of King William Street. It's interesting that they are marching, uh, men marching asleep, as Owen would say. They are flowing over London Bridge, undone by this kind of living death, headed to this church that is tolling the hours. But the sound that the bell is making at the church is not a wedding celebration. It's not the bells that herald the beginning of a, of a mass or a church service. But it is a dead sound and a final stroke of nine. That this is more of a death knell. It seems more like a funeral march. Again, emphasizing how death has undone so many. This image of crowds and crowds of people flowing over... London Bridge, only to end up at St. Mary Woolness for the dead sound of nine, the final stroke of their life, that they are marching to their own graves, unaware, unsung. There I saw one I knew, so the speaker declares that he recognizes someone, and stopped him, crying, Stetson, you who were with me in the ships at Me Lai, which is, is an interesting juxtaposition here. Me Lai is actually a battle from the Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage um, centuries before. But it seems Eliot is mashing these time frames together, uh, hearkening back to the reminiscence of World War I, that the recognition in this long march of people who have been undone by death, the recognition of someone who fought alongside you at arms. Uh, Mi Lai might very well be a veiled uh, reference to a battle of the First World War. He recognizes Stetson and says, You who were with me in the ships at Milai, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, the garden image appearing again, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? And perhaps we have one of the sadder moments in this section where the prospect of resurrection is hinted at again. But it's not a true resurrection. It's not a pure resurrection. The dead don't come back to life in the wasteland. There is no rebirth after death. But here there is a kind of rebirth that's hinted at. He says, the corpse you planted in your garden, has it begun to sprout? And the only way a corpse can begin to sprout is if the corpse decomposes in the ground and feeds the roots in the soil, causing some vegetation to grow, acting as a sort of compost which is a form of resurrection, that the essential molecules of the corpse reconvene into nutrients that supply life for a plant, but it's not the kind of resurrection that religion and philosophy and uh, spiritual considerations of times gone by have once promised us. It's a 
corrupted version of it. It's a putrid, disgusting version, this image of a corpse becoming life by fertilizing plants. Uh, it's no real great blossom. But also there's no answer to the question either. The corpse may or may not begin to sprout. It may or may not bloom. We get no resolve to that question. Has the sudden frost disturbed its bed? Has the cold unearthed the corpse? Oh, keep the dog far hence, that's friend to men, or with his nails, he'll dig it up again. Here we have another kind of resurrection. So one way we could have uh, the corpse that's been planted come back again is to have it fertilize the ground and uh, feed and nourish a plant. Another, perhaps more grotesque way of seeing that corpse again is for the dog to unearth it with its claws. That's no real rebirth at all. It's just uh, digging the ground up to try to recapture what has already died, yet is decomposing in the ground. In this last line, we get another quote from Baudelaire, a line that Baudelaire had used in his poems. You, hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable, mon frère. You, hypocrite reader, my likeness, my brother. And here again, Eliot seems to be speaking directly to the reader. You, hypocrite reader, my likeness, my brother, we are not exempt from the same pains and the same realizations that all of these figures, all of these voices in the burial of the dead have had to consider.